Hello, everyone. I'm Mansoor. With me is Matthew. Um, I'm the founder of Open Origins. Um, we started about two years ago. Matthew's been there since basically day one. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about sort of the problem uh, that we're trying to solve um, and set it in a bit of a historical context. And after that, we'll present Frankly, which is our solution to that problem or one of the solutions to the problem. Uh, Yes, that was on the agenda screen. Uh, <laughs> all right, let's go to the next one. Okay. Uh, yes, before we before we get into the meat of the matter, I'm gonna give you a very complicated and convoluted history lesson. Uh, make a simple problem very complicated. So, we will talk about authenticity, um, what it means today, and how we think we can get some back. Before we get there, we'll talk about regression. Um, before that, we'll talk about a certain kind of superpower that all of us have. Before that, we'll talk about aristocracy. And before that, we'll talk about dog's lungs. Um, we're actually going to talk about a very specific dog's lungs. We're going to talk about this dog's lung, uh, which is for a painting or an or a illustration of an experiment that was conducted in 1667 by a certain M. Hook um, in front of the Royal Society. And this experiment, uh, they wanted to figure out whether you needed to breathe to be alive. So they connected a dog's lungs to a bellows and sometimes they pumped air and sometimes they didn't. Um, turns out you do need to breathe to be alive, uh, science. And that's basically all I have to say about this dog's lungs. Um, if you go to the next slide. I already see comments. <laughs> yes, the reason I the reason I bring up uh, those dog slugs is because I wanted to talk about the first paragraph of the description of that experiment, in which uh, M. Hook describes that the experiment was done in the presence of the noble company. Now, obviously, the noble company uh, in this case means uh, the aristocracy. Um, Maddie, can you go to the next slide? Sure. Um, and more importantly, the noble company means um, eyewitnesses. So again, next slide. Um, back then, experiments in the Royal Society used to be performed in this gallery, um, and they would be performed in front of all these aristocrats who would, at the end of the experiment, sign a piece of paper saying that they have observed the results as stated uh, in the report. Um, and that was basically the highest standard of evidence you could have in 1667 right so this was what we used to do when it was basically impossible for anyone else to reproduce experiments you would just perform it in front of trusted eyewitnesses um this next slide Matty. Sure. and that basically remained the standard for you know, our evidence um or the highest standard for evidence that is until we discovered a certain kind of superpower which is Next slide. <laughs> Photography. Um, you see, in, in the 1800s, um, when photography was invented, it wasn't just like a new technology uh, that we'd found. Uh, it was a superpower uh, because it converted eyewitnesses to actual evidence. Um, next slide, Matty. Um, it gave us a superpower to know that a certain thing has occurred without being present there. Um, and I would argue that this was the first time that we could actually say that as a fact. Um, next slide. Um, but of course, with any superpower, um, there comes a fall and photography has had its fall from its evidentiary status. Um, next slide. And that's all because of they don't make them like they used to. Um, back then, uh, photography used to be a simple matter of lenses and a light painting itself on a photographic film. Um, there was really not much scope for interpretation. Um, it was just the laws of physics acting on a film. Um, obviously, modern cameras um, aren't made that way. So modern cameras have... Next slide. Uh, modern cameras have digital signal processors that do a bunch of computational stuff with the light hitting on them. They filter it, they do color processing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, and when we initially made that transition from analog to digital cameras, there was a basically a moral panic um, around whether we could trust photography ever again. Um, and for the most part, we've, we've kind of been saved from the doom and gloom scenarios that were laid out in the papers from like the 1970s. Um, and I would argue that most of that credit for saving us from that avalanche of disinformation goes to journalists. Um, next slide. Uh, because journalists perform some very important functions. They do fact checking, they do financial disclosures to see if there are conflicts of interest. Some of them might even do forensics analysis when uh, a whistleblower submits documents to them. Uh, and increasingly they've started using automated detection tools to see if, uh, for example, a piece of media is being reused from an older story. Uh, next slide. And that model worked really well when this was the form in which we received our news. Um, and the biggest threat vectors to the content itself were very simple, rudimentary sorts of edits. Obviously, this is not how we receive our news anymore. Yeah, next slide, please. Wait a minute. Some of us still read newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're color now. <laughs> they are color. <laughs> um, but apart from a few outliers, some of whom are on this call, uh, the modern world has different media consumption habits. Um, most of us get our news from sources such as these, this one. Um, and to say that they don't do much by way of due diligence would be an understatement. Uh, moreover, if you go to the next slide. Actually, no, uh, before we get to that, uh, I do want to point out a few positives um, that having moved from that old model of uh, a trusted third party vetting sources and broadcasting to this more peer-to-peer -peer way of user-generated content being spread has resulted in some positive things. Um, next slide. We've seen, we've seen uh, mass movements that might not have happened uh, if it were not for this new form of mass communication. Um, so here we've got pictures of the Arab Spring and Black Lives Matter. But it does bring a bunch of negatives along with it. Um, some of the problems that we'll talk about here are um, bots, um, anxiety and depression, fake news, and AI. So let's talk about bots. Uh, this might. Yes, Matty, let's go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know where you're going here. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm just trying to see if I can request control from you, but I can't. Oh, yes, I can. Go for it. Uh, ask it. Yeah. Off you go. Oh, no. Open system settings. Hang on a minute. Never mind. Never mind. No. Uh, let's, oh. let's keep going. Let's keep going. Oh, okay. um, so the, the, the threat vector that bots pose are that they change the way we perceive legitimacy. Um, I think this is most obviously demonstrated in this practice of astroturfing, uh, which is where you fake an entire grassroots movement by just having a bunch of automated accounts make your opinion seem a lot more popular than it is. Um, this has been done widely by the oil and gas industry uh, where they've created these nonprofit organizations that promote talking points from the oil and gas community, uh, uh, oil and gas industry, um, and then buy thousands upon thousands of bot accounts to upvote, uh, retweet, share those opinions making them look a lot more popular, which ends up influencing political decisions. Hmm. Um, there's another form of um, attack from bots, which is that you can do effective censorship uh, by just reporting uh, profiles that you don't like in an automated fashion. Um, or you could just do old fashioned intimidation by sending threats via a bunch of faceless accounts. Uh, next slide, Matty. Um, there's also anxiety and depression. Um, there's this phenomenon of Instagram face and Snapchat dysmorphia where uh, young people, uh, because they consume so much media on Instagram and Snapchat where everything is touched up and filtered, have uh, gotten severe body image issues. Uh, there's been a real spike in the amount of uh, teenage plastic surgeries uh, over the last few years. Uh, as well as um, depressive thoughts related to body image. Um, there's also doom scrolling where you've been scrolling and wasting your life and you don't feel so good about that afterwards. Um, um, filter bubbles, 
Um, I think everyone in this call would know what that is. And after all of that, your uncle doesn't talk to you anymore, but there are some positives, I guess. Um, we internally call this doom social, and um, we kind of see this as a direct consequence of how social media companies have uh, their incentives aligned. Next slide, please. Um, and then obviously the last issue and the one that we target most, uh, yeah, uh, Phil, your comment about these practices and social societal dysfunctions are carried over from the offline world is true. I would argue that the scale of these issues makes them a completely different beast though. You can take one bad idea and spread it globally very quickly. Um, and that just requires different ways of dealing with those bad practices that we used to have in the offline world. Uh, coming back to fake news, which is the place that the thing that we focus on most um, uh, in frankly, um, fake news has always been around. Another one of those things that's been carried over from the offline world. Uh, Maddie, go to the next slide, please. Uh, there's the old fashioned way of doing fake news. This is a post from Turning Point USA where you know they're making a point about um, uh, Venezuela, I think, in, in this particular post, but obviously the photo was taken from somewhere else. This is Japan after the earthquake. Um, so this kind of out of context captioning is, you know, your run of the mill fake news. Then there's more sophisticated forms of fake news. Uh, next slide, Mary. Uh, such as deep fakes, um, where deep fakes are genuinely getting sophisticated enough that I can't tell them apart anymore. Um, I've been, I've been giving variations of this talk for the last four years. And I used to say that in two or three years, they would be sophisticated enough that humans can't tell them apart, but I genuinely can't tell them apart anymore. So I'm both happy and sad that my predictions have come true. <laughs> um, the other thing that's scary about them is just how easy they are to produce. I think Matty produced deep fakes of someone we were going to speak on a Zoom call with uh, in about 10 minutes using just his laptop. Um, so that is also worrying. Yeah. Well, uh, what second. was the reaction of the uh, person that you uh, showed the deep fake to? We ended up talking to someone in their company, not them themselves, but we had a good laugh about it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then what I would argue is sort of the greatest upcoming challenge to the human web is generative AI in all its various forms. Um, if you go to the next slide, Matty. Um, I've, got a, I've got a slideshow of some pictures here. Um, so I want you guys to look at these faces. Um, so go to the next slide, Matty. And these faces. And then, next slide. In the chat, please enter the numbers of the people you think are real people which of these are real people wait a minute i know this is rigged i'm positive that <laughs> none of these are real people that's the problem right <laughs> yeah. i mean tell us is anyone on this screen a real person <laughs> no none of them are real none they were, no none. none of them no. oh yeah um uh, so they were they were all generated from this website called this person does not exist.com uh worth going there it just you know refresh the page and it will give you a new fake face it is uh, stunning because i would have looked at this and said at least two of those are real i i always like when i was doing this i was completely fooled by the first one because there's just so much detail in her hair in her eyes like that just face looks so real um the other ones looked like they were fake photos for some reason, um, but I don't have anything that I can point to to help you spot the difference. Um, yeah, and, and, the, and the scary thing again is that this person does not exist, has existed for two years now. So the modern forms of that website are even better. They do this in even greater resolution. And they, they, it seems that they all generate fairly attractive um, fake people. Yes, uh, I guess something to do with averaging over a bunch of faces. Which I'm generates... certain they probably don't have much of a problem in generating unattractive fake people too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're just uh, not as drawn to them. There's there's another website where you can submit like prototypes of faces that you want fakes of. So you could submit like Eric's face, and it will generate you fake people that kind of look like Eric. 
doppelgangers. I run into those all the time. <laughs> all right, next slide, please. Uh, this one's really interesting as well. So um, this one is from Stable Diffusion. Um, and the prompt that was given to Stable Diffusion was a gathering of people in Bogota. Um, now, I don't think this one is as sophisticated as the other ones. Like, there are clearly things that are wrong with this photo, like the number of fingers on people's hands, uh, just the facial expressions seem a bit odd. Um, but the thing that I find very interesting here is that the prompt is very neutral. It just says uh, group of people in Bogota. But just because Bogota has so many negative things written about it on the web that these people look distressed and as if they're mourning something. Uh, and that's, I think, a side effect of this generative AI thing that we don't discuss enough, which is that they reinforce stereotypes uh, that are already present on the web. Um, and also, you can imagine that you know, given a couple of years, all those minor defects in this uh, photo, like the number of fingers not being right, will be solved um, in a matter of months, not years. Um, and at that point, uh, it's just very easy for you to fake entire protests or uh, of some sort of a calamity, a mass shooting or whatever. Um, and then we're in really, really dangerous territory. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so this was this was a set of predictions that uh, uh, we came up with about what happens if we don't have measures against generative AI. Uh, one is catfishing just becomes the default, not just on dating apps, but on all apps, LinkedIn included. Um, as I said, if you can have AI people, AI tweets, AI friends, then maybe you can have AI generated political upheavals as well. Uh, if you take the concept of astroturfing, but now you can produce facts as well. Um, your astroturfing campaign is only limited by the amount of resources that you want to put into it then. And again, the resources are basically a few GPUs and a couple of technically proficient people. Thanks for that point yeah. of comment. Yeah, if you haven't read Fall, and it's a, it's a very unusual book, but it's absolutely brilliant. A literally entire natural disaster. They faked out the, the, the news industry around the world. Now, of course, it's a novel. It's a science fiction novel, but that it's near hmm. the start of the book. It's just so startling how, how it's pulled off. It's brilliant. Okay, interesting. I will add it to my list. Um, Sorry, Eric, were you saying something? Not me. All right. And then uh, any picture you see is unbelievable, not in the sense that it's amazing, but in the sense that it's just unbelievable. And online spaces become just great fictions uh, where the only things you can trust are the things that you trust in your offline world, which is interpersonal connections. Um, next slide, please. And so, you know, we call this a post-truth world. Um, I know that post-truth was used for the Trump administration, but I think this post-truth is a lot more real in a sense. Um, next slide. So yeah, that's that's where we are. And now I'll hand over to Matty to say to see how he's going to save us all. Ah, well, so thanks for um, for setting me up with such a such an easy easy task there. And the only thing I can say to that is. <clears throat> Those of you that recognize the dad's army slide when you see one on Sergeant Fraser. So, so are we doomed or are we not doomed? That's uh, let's take you through our sort of thinking um, as to what, as to where we are. And let's sort of bring a little bit of technology into this on top of the social problem. So summarize, you know, what sort of the major themes of what Mansell has been talking about. Misrepresentative media, synthetic media, artificial media, inauthentic media. Oh, so many terms. This stuff can be generated increasingly trivially. You know, we've got, I mean, especially look at chat GPT going, going nuts at the minute as well. I mean, that's that's a big thing that's out there. So there's there, there is a lot of a lot of content being being produced by by people. I'm not sure my mother is quite there yet. She's using my, my sort of my, my weather mark with regards to how the technology is filtered down, but it's not going to be far, not going to be long off before she's she's generating um, fake media as well for whatever purposes. The there are many significant significant harms, which I don't think we really need to go into at all because we've sort of covered that. So that's where we are. What do we do about it? Well, don't panic. What can we say about that? Right. I promise I'll stop Dad's army means right now so 
we look at some approaches. We looked at different approaches to solve this problem. And the first one is train the user. So the pictures that you see on the right-hand side of this slide are, well, the top one is a press release by uh, People's Republic of North Korea, or Democratic People, North Korea. Um, and they had a, a military hovercraft landing exercise and they shot some um, publicity photos out to the world. And these were later examined. You can see the big red circles around there. Basically, they'd Photoshop some of the some of these hovercraft in to make it look like they had more hovercraft and their army was thus bigger and more impressive. And what I'll give you for that is that I can see if you kind of like look closely at the kind of things of the big red circle. Yeah, they look quite similar, but I wouldn't have spotted that. And this was done in 2013. So it's 10 years ago, very almost 10 years ago when this was done. And as we said, te technology is you know, whipping along at such a cadence at the moment in terms of the ability to do this. So can we train the user to be able to detect this stuff? And I just categorically say, no, you can't. Um, it's kind of the same problem that we get in another form of security, which is um, looking at phishing email. We train the users to spot phishing emails. Does it work? Well, we still got a phishing email problem, really, haven't we? People wanting to, you know, send and sending stuff in. It's the same kind of problem. And we don't think that that's going to be the way to do it. It's never going to be perfect. So training you. I'm just going to point out, I work at a cybersecurity company, okay, with a bunch of cybersecurity experts. I can't tell a phishing email. So what, 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 are you kidding? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I also used to work there, so I know very much so. Yes, it's training the user is, is a step, but it's not, it is not the be all and end all. We cannot train ourselves because humans are just not good enough to detect this stuff, whether these be edits for misrepresenting something or whether it be AI generated content. And uh, so... I'm afraid users are not the answer. Let's try another one. So forensic techniques. So well, coming back to cybersecurity, it's a bit like um, you know, your, your IR teams and forensic teams you know, crawling through a laptop or whatever, looking for traces of interesting interesting things. Can, can we use forensic techniques on it? Well, I mean, just look at the stats that we've got here in the middle. You know, 25 million images uploaded to Flickr every day, 350 million photos uploaded to Facebook every day. You know, 1.3 billion photos shared on Instagram every day um, and 500 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute. I mean, it's a lot. And just employing the sheer armies of forensic examiners. I mean, it's it's the cube farm from hell, isn't it? It's just going to it's just going to stretch into the distance that there are going to be literally millions of people trying to do this. And that's a, you know, there, there, are some, there are lots of other problems as well. You know, who's going to pay for this stuff? If every picture, you know, that, that arrived on the internet had to be kind of validated, it looks like it's a censorship issue. People looking at my pictures, I want these pictures to be private. What's going on with this? You know, it's, it's, it's going to spoil the technique. It feels like a non-starter. So forensic techniques have their place, but mass media, no, not going to happen. So the next thing, so... If, We've got AI generating some, well, you've seen some amazing um, people that don't exist and things. So, you know, and it is true that we think there is good money at the moment to be made in making AI detectors for AI generating or generators uh, content. You know, can we get an AI to detect the thing that AI makes? Seems like a natural, uh, a natural argument. But I would say that it's a bit like kind of a snake eating its tail, really. It kind of goes around in circles. So... We kind of go, oh yes, we've you know we we, we create a detector. Oh great, we can detect some of this AI stuff. You know the, these things here. We're in a, in a happy place. And the the guys who are writing this generator go, fantastic! You've built this detector. We can use your detector to train our generator and make it better. They come up with version two. And then our version one detector doesn't work anymore. So we have to make our detector better. And great, we can detect it again. And the the bad guys go, oh great, oh, got version two detect. And it goes around and around and around and you know sort of the cycle spins round to a point whereby it becomes so good that it just doesn't matter you know it has become it has become effectively perfect so that's you know that's Patty, i would just i would just point out that instead of a circle this is more like a spiral right because is, yeah, the situation is getting worse for yeah. the society at large yeah yeah it is I, I see it as a snake eating its tail but it's yeah i'd agree it is just going down a great big tube to a point whereby we just stop caring um, it will accelerate the um, it will accelerate that kind of singularity of indistinguishable media. So that's not a 
winning proposition um, at the moment. Um, I'd also, well, no, let's just leave it at that. It's a, it's a, it's not where we're going to go. So the next sort of sort of angle on this is we sort of touched on this a little bit earlier with uh, journalism. How do journalists figure out whether or not something that they have received that they don't necessarily have full trust in the origins of? How do they, how do they make a call and say? We think that this media is good enough that we're going to put it on the front page of our newspaper and thus associate our reputation with it. And there's a lot of essentially contextual forensic uh, techniques that happen as well here, which is saying, you know, you know, trying to just follow sort of the paper trail as to where the original version of it came from, who, who captured it, where do we think this photo or video or media of any sort, where, where was it captured? Okay, you say it's captured in, I don't know, in Ukraine, say. Um, when did it, when was it supposed to have been captured? Well, it's supposed to have been captured at this time of year. Okay, well, what is the lighting like? You know, is the sun in the right place in the sky for the time of day that this was taken? Are the buildings in the background? Can we match those up to somewhere where it's appropriate to be, etc.? You can do quite a lot of that. And there, is, there are quite established techniques for, for going through it. But this is, it's on a, it's on a level with sort of military intelligence analysis, analysis of, um, and reconnaissance photographs and things it's that it's in that sort of level there and there's a lot there's a lot of effort required in order to do that so can we do this well maybe we can do this for things that matter a lot um but we wouldn't want to do that we wouldn't want to do it all the time and it's very contextual so computers will find it hard well i say they find it hard but who knows what they're gonna be doing in five years time so it gives us it gives us a kind of another uh, another sort of angle that we can look at, which is a bit more, which plays a bit more to the strengths of computers. So looking at this from the point of view of provenance, can we, I mean, provenance is, is, a, is an issue with, in many, many respects. Um, where did a diamond come from? Is it, is it a blood diamond? Is it a synthetic diamond? Is it a real one that's been dug out of a mine in South Africa by De Beers or whatever it is? And thus, what would I want to pay for it, for instance? Um, where is a piece of artwork from? Do I have the paper trail? Do I know, can I prove beyond reasonable doubt that it is not being created by some forger um, and attempted to be sold for a lot of money, etc. So provenance is an established, um, an established concept and we can do it technically. Um, I'm hoping with the audience here that we can move fairly quickly through this, but pretty much computers are good at doing some things and they could do some things that are quite simple quite quickly. And we've got a solution that might match onto this quite well, which is a thing called a blockchain. Now, the aside that I'd ask you here is if anybody's got any really good pictures that will describe what a blockchain is, that'd be great. But again, so I just I end it with text. So um, blockchains. I'm just going to rattle through some utter basics here so we can we can be on the same sort of page rather than trying to explain, you know, teach him. Um, teach you guys how to suck eggs so we're not talking here about bitcoins we're not talking about crypto in the kind of the currency sense and we're not talking about board ape nfts and things like that it's none of that at all blockchain is data structure and it is a useful tool uh, for us as we as computer scientists will help you know that um basic principles super quick diagram on the left have a number of blocks each one contains the hash of the previous one store some things in them and as you move forward, you've got this constant record. And as soon as something, um, you should be able to detect tampering and changes throughout that, that history. So you have a fairly immutable history. And a very simplistic diagram on the right-hand side suggesting if you have a number of nodes, each containing a copy of these, and um, you can embody the trust through these different nodes, and they can vote on whether or not they believe that um, any of the changes made are correct. When they all agree, then that block can be accepted into the into the bigger master record. We're going to leave it pretty much like that. Please shout if it's not making enough sense, because we can talk some more about this. Okay, right. I'll just ask quickly um, if I if I use the term hash, is that going to be people happy with that? Spot on. Okay. Right. Okay, so if we were to record a certain certain amounts of metadata about a piece of media, um, such as um, where it was taken, what created it, what kind of device, sensor, camera, phone, whatever it might be, potentially an identity of the creator or the 
owner of the creating device. And we take a hash of some of the, the media at that point, and we can store all of that metadata in a safe place. We've then got a record of when something was created, if we can trust it. So storing that on a blockchain seems like a good idea, but the first thing to kind of address is, I'm going to say, well, PKI has been around for donkey's years. Why wouldn't you use PKI on it? So broadly, um, we think that the, 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 the blockchain related solution is better for sharing trust and is more resilient to interference. To cut a long story short, because we can spread, um, we can spread the trust between different organizations and there's no, no one organization necessarily has full control over it or is able to make a, a um, make a change to a historical record. Um, and it's less susceptible to, to a loss of control um, of that sort of system. So that's where we want to be. As an aside, if anybody fancies hosting one of our blockchain nodes, they'd be more than welcome. Please speak to us afterwards. So similar idea slightly different focus yeah sorry maddie just just jumping in on the last thing you said sure um, yeah the the idea with our again we're using a private permission blockchain but we've got some consensus algorithm that should scale to thousands of nodes pretty well um so yeah the the idea with this permission blockchain is that we want as many people that we don't control uh in any way um to be nodes on the network uh, we want to reach a place where even if Open Origins goes out of business tomorrow, whatever anchors we've put on that blockchain continue to live. Uh, and any apps built on top of that blockchain yeah, continue to survive. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Cheers. Right. So, so sort of illustrate the, the process in a highly simplified manner and show what things it's good for. So starting on the left-hand side, camera sensor, CCD or other talks to a camera processor or processors. Now the model that we can think about a DSLR style camera, which, um, or we could think about uh, one of these, my camera still phone, mobile phone of sorts. There are multiple, multiple, multiple processes inside doing DSP type stuff, doing processing things to make your photographs look better to the human perception, et cetera. But fundamentally your picture is created um, onto a device and it has processing abilities uh, at that time. Typical process would then involve storing this somewhere on the interwebs in a cloud somewhere. Many variations this exist and then being consumed later. I'm not talking about anything rocket science here. The other variation on this is typically the bottom flow here, which suggests that there is editing that happens in it. And it's interesting just to look at just to relate to this diagram and think okay how is this working and what does what does editing mean with respect to um, a blockchain related solution so if you had a blockchain in the bottom here the green arrows um we have an anchoring operation here as soon as the media is um is is created so we anchor it and we know what it was like at that time we have some trust in it at that point and the consumer can verify it at the far end when they can say, is this thing, has this thing been edited or tampered with or interfered with, or did it originate in a place that I trust? And I trust, like if I can trust this area on the, on the left-hand side where it has been created, then I can have some, have some confidence in the media on the right-hand side. Okay. Now editing, um, as I represent there, is a legitimate process in some situations, whether that is you're putting some filter on in your Instagram, whatever it is, you know, that's, that's one, one context, but that does take away from it. And you'll lose, you know, it's, it's, it's a use of media, but you'll know you're no longer representing the original image in quite the same way. So wanting to know about that, it could be editing in a journalistic context. It could be just like cropping something down, rescaling it, resizing it, transcoding it into a different format for many, many reasons, um, as it transmit, as it floats around the internet or, or other. So there's a whole lot of complexity, um, in that. And sometimes that's done for a legitimate purpose and sometimes that's not. Um, so we looked initially at saying, okay, do we want to support a, journal a journalism sort of process and say, okay, if we now need to provide the tools in order to be able to support editing operations, you know, the, the, the photographer took the photograph, it came into the editing room, they looked at it, they cropped it down, they moved it around, they rescaled it, they changed it around, they put a bit of subtitles or text on the bottom of it. 
And at each time we re-anchored it on the blockchain to show what all the edits were and this, that the far end we can, we can bring it back. One of our considerations as we as we looked into this. So, but I'll come back to some of the some of the way that we thought through this as we went on. So what do we need to do in order to make this sort of model work? Well, anchoring as close to the sensor as possible. Ideally, we would love um, a, you know, a chip inside a camera unit that can actually pull the raw, um, the raw um, data that's coming off the CCD and be able to anchor it at that stage. Um, that's quite hard work, um, but we stand a better chance with some of the other processes on the device. It's a little bit further down the process. The customer needs to be able to figure out that it's unedited. So they need some way to be able to practically figure it out. So they need either uh, a way it's presented to them that says, yeah, this is good, or no, that it's not. As I alluded to, supporting legitimate editing of workflows or illegitimate editing of workflows, if that matter, to be able to explain what's going on, that adds quite a bit of complexity to the model. Also, the image capture part, only the parts on the left hand side, the camera and the camera processor, that anything that's happening around here needs to be treated as secure and tamper resistant, because if you can interfere with that, then you can feed in media into that uh, cycle, which will ruin trust in the rest of it. You can, that's where you feed in your AI generated um, content, for instance, and people then seeing that, they'll have no trust in the rest of the system because it all comes down to trust. Um, now, this type of solution could be used with synthetic media. If you wanted to register it and say, look, I've generated this thing on this person does not exist.com and I can anchor it here. And that is, that is its origin. That's fine. And everybody can say, oh, that's, that's fine. It's not trying to pass itself off as being a legitimate ID photo of somebody or anything like that. So there's no reason why that can be, that needs to be the case as well. So it can be used in a, what might be seen as a, a negative, positive negative context. Final words for that later. So we then sort of thought, well, we we like this solution. What are we going to do with it? And these are sort of the some of the broader themes that we kind of looked at. We thought, well, what produces loads of um, loads of video media um, that needs to definitely be definitely need to be proven to be true, and that's CCTV. And it's, in many respects, it's a really boring problem. Um, and also CCTV, you know, CCTV movies just aren't very exciting. Nothing happens for 99.99% of the time. And then, you know, you get 15 seconds of, I don't know, uh, you know, blowing the, blowing the doors off the, the bank vault, or whatever it might be. So there is the CCTV use case is very, is interesting from the point of view that it works very well for this sort of style of model. Um, there are, there's more we can talk about it here, but it's, we need to have, we have trust. If we put trust into the device, then it means that the control center that aggregates typically all of the feed can be less secured because a lot of the um, issues of CCTV tend to be um, bank robbers will have paid their mate that works in the, in the control center to lose the tape that happens to be on the camera that they, when they conduct their bank raid or whatever it might be, or, you know, make sure that they, something was switched off or um, you know, they cut a bit out of the tape or they whatever. If you're recording that on a blockchain, you'd be able to say at the very least, even if the tape has gone or the, the recording has gone missing, this was recorded at this time. You can tell you what its hash was if you ever find it again, but you know that it was recorded at that time and you know at least that that, that had happened in that control center. So there are angles there with CCTV as well, um, but that would, from our point of view, to progress that, that would probably require us working with the CCTV provider possibly a camera manufacturer um, uh, some degree. We next have a look at um, news and media, because they're going to be talked about journalistic context. Um, we like the idea, you know, very much of, you know, being able to kind of like just you know, prove things are real. That's, that's what we're all about. So we talked to traditional media organizations and we broadly discovered that they are not generally wanting to be first to adopt a new and exciting new technology, um, they have very slow technology acquisition cycles, and as a fast-moving startup, that doesn't really suit us very well at all. So we can have conversations, but these conversations will probably go on for a few years until everybody else decides they want to do it, at which point they'll move very, very quickly. So until there is that sort of widespread uh, bomb going off in that space, um, we think we're not going to get a lot of traction with, why, uh, with traditional media organizations. So... We're considering also grassroots. Um, so 
media organizations that are or or media individuals almost that are too small necessarily to have a voice maybe they are not in a country that that has an established journalistic tradition and organizations that are trustable maybe there's corruption in the organize in the country but if you've got some footage of something really quite explosive in content but nobody believes you what are you going to do about it but if you can prove that that was really taken and you can provide a lot of those journalistic contextual um assertions doesn't that help you get your story out so there's an angle there that we are we're interested in um, at this time so next we kind of thought well what we want to do is we want to get this technology adopted and established so while still having our interest in the news and media side so we looked at a consumer focused um media platform which we're hopefully going to be a little bit of a jack of all trades do lots of things and well basically we've called it frankly which is also where that confusion over our name is frankly or open origins our company is called open origins our product is called frankly so um that's broadly where this kind of goes to okay so let's talk a little bit about frankly it will you can download it from your app store um it's an iphone only application at this time um, our iphone security model is quite good the android one fills me with dread and that's a whole other conversation um matty sorry to interrupt you but we're running welcome. out of time and i would like to have some time left for q a okay uh, let's just quickly finish. i'm going to rattle through this at a yes. fair old pace yeah, yeah. The solution is broadly what we talked about using the phone in a, with a secure model using the camera on the phone and delivering the delivering the content back into our service where we've registered on a blockchain um and providing it in a slight social media guise might be the easiest way to describe it simplistic social media guise um it's what we do we're proving at point of capture um We've talked through this as well about the benefits of blockchain um etc take a photo through frankly you validate it it's stored along with the, ver the metadata and the, val the verification information and this is what it looks like so things to say here on our on the left hand side we have think of it as a social media view picture of an event happening um this is about strikes happening fairly recently in britain teachers were striking for they want um uh, more money or better working conditions um this is a this is an event that was happened to take them live um the picture in the middle is a bit more interesting as well we can provide a little bit more assertion that this is taken on a real camera because the iphone in particular has got um depth sensors built into it it uses a combination of lidar and um some clever uh, modeling of depth a ton of flight and similar so what you're actually seeing there is a 3d representation of the scene that was taken um, on the left hand side so where we've got some depth information it's demonstrating that it is not a picture of a picture which is you know am i taking a picture of a screen of, of a faked screen is one one worry that you would have at this sort of stage and demonstrating on the right that some of the you know with some information that we are recording um when we're recording it so there um we'd like to think that we are the uh the david to the generative ai goliath um maybe that is our conceit but uh we'll take it which can lead us into question and answers so thank you thank you matthew and Mansoor, I've, I've downloaded the app. I've taken a I've taken a little tour, um, and uh, it, it is it is interesting. I like I like the um, the visual representation of of, of the provenance. Uh, Sue, you've got you've got your hand up. You got a question? Yeah, I I had a quick question. Uh, but thank you for that presentation. It's a great background on dogs' lungs. Um, so you did talk a little bit about the kind of customers and interaction. Uh, so I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit on what's getting traction and what's proving difficult and also uh, the business models that might be uh, 
behind this. And also on the, on the technology front, uh, I was wondering if you would care to contrast this with uh, say possibilities based on Kerry and ACDC and uh, things of that ilk. So I'll wait for your hand. I'll, I'll talk to the business side of things and then I'll hand it off to Matty. Um, yeah, so we've, we've had some very interesting conversations with news organizations where um, they, at least at this point, weren't very interested in a SaaS solution that they will give to their journalists to record trusted photos or videos because they source most of it from third parties. Um, the current model for journalism to source stories is to basically sit on Twitter all day and see the trending tags and to try to find um, uh, try to find uh, something that's worth publishing and then try to vet whatever they see. Um, so there is a bit of a chicken and egg problem where our platform becomes interesting with, to them when there's content on it and uh, it does it's not very interesting if there's no content on it, right? Um, so instead, what we focus on right now is getting a lot of journalism students uh, on board so that they can start compiling stories. Like if they're going, to, going on a field trip, uh, we've got a bunch of students going to Nairobi uh, this weekend. We're asking them, you know, during your field trip, you're going to do these urban development studies, record what you see. And the model is that if it's interesting, we will talk to our uh, partners in news organizations and have that content be licensed. And will make a money as uh, a cut of that transaction. Uh, Matty? Okay, sorry, can you refresh me on for which angle it was you wanted from a technical side? Uh, yeah, uh, things like uh, authentic chain data containers and uh, things of that help that I, I guess are not necessarily dependent on blockchains, but but use, I guess, a, a slightly different model of uh, sort of keeping track of authentic uh, or data and its uh, sort of evolution, if you will. Okay, so I, we sort of went probably went back, back to basics, but back to first principles a little bit more than, than that, because we don't, we saw that the the problems that we're trying to solve can be solved in a relatively lightweight way. And we hope that that's, if we can, if we can demonstrate that this mechanism works, we might be able to expand this to be able to provide, provide this trust to the, you know, well, basically to, to the world really. So it just, it felt that it was, it's, it's light enough weight by by doing by going the way that we are that we don't need to implement anything that's more to the heavyweight behind the scenes so the idea is you know we're starting like this to try and gain traction to demonstrate that the process is viable um and then we can we can expand um sort of from there um okay thank you that that doesn't quite i don't quite address you but uh, no th thanks a lot yeah there's a, there's a question in the chat that I want to address. Um, it says about uh, news organizations don't want to be liable and increase risk around its provenance piece. Um, it's, it's very interesting because um, that's kind of almost our pitch uh, and it seems to have resonated in the conversations we've had, which is, look, right now you guys spend a lot of time and money trying to vet things that come to you via Twitter or via whatever whistleblowing channels you have. Uh, we are willing to take on the liability for at least the integrity of the content being sent to you. We don't take any liability for the narrative, um, but you can do a lot of, you know, you can do away with all of that time and money being spent on forensics or on just Google rever reverse image search um, and trust the content as it comes, if it comes via our technology. And that seems to have resonated very well. Um, I don't know if if that's the same conversation that you had. Uh, oh, it's actually the other way because in in quite a few conversations they mentioned that the system, the idea is solid. Mm -hmm. It's just that uh, having so much provenance built in creates a bit of risk, and 
and most organizations, at least in, I'm speaking from India and, and in these jurisdictions, they're not willing to pile up that amount of risk. And it, it's easy to skate by claiming that due diligence was lacking and can be taken up later on. Oh, so you, you're point. saying you don't have plausible den deniability if you have problems. Yeah, I mean, no, no, no one is very keen to use that word though. <laughs> Yeah, so, I can see why. So, so I want to take a, a little farther too, because I think it's a, a really interesting point. You know, the, sort of the one concept is you you look for the technical devices to be the trust anchor, right? So the photo is taken, you trust the manufacturer that they've done their job and everything's recording, you trust them. The other is, uh, you know, at some point in the process chain, you know, maybe that's an editor, maybe that's a copy editor. They put their stamp on it and say, you know, uh, forget what came before me. I'm putting, you know, I've done my due diligence and I'm signing off that this is legit. Um, so in, in your kind of viewpoint of, of the future, this thing, where do you see that balance? Do you see it, you know, trying to rely more heavily on, on sort of the device and then this long chain of provenance or, you know, finding somewhere along that chain where somebody will raise their hand and say, I will, I will make the, uh, the statement that I think this is legit and you have to go off of my uh, reputation. I, I'll tell you my preference and then what I am afraid of. My preference <laughs> would be that we we have a sort of technology-based version of this. So you trust the um, hardware processor, uh, trusted execution environment or whatever on the device. Uh, there's, by the way, there's more things that you can do than just relying on the trusted execution environment. For example, you can do liveness tests. So there's, there's neat things that you can do with flashing the flash of the camera in response to a challenge to make sure that that same reflection is being sent back uh, to make sure that that entire video feed is not being spoofed, even if you have compromised the trusted execution environment. So there's neat things you can do to sort of mitigate the risk of that being compromised. Um, and then once you have the original captured somewhere, you have some sort of a trusted way of transcoding that into a low resolution enough thing that it can be displayed next to the final product. And you let people make up their own minds, whether they think that the final product is a natural derivative of the source material you see. Uh, the model that you're suggesting is the one that scares me, where we end up with you know Adobe probably because they've got all the Photoshop uh, installs, Adobe becoming the central authority for what's trusted or not. Uh, or Microsoft or AWS, because they say, okay, if it was processed on our platform here, and these are the operations that we say were performed. Uh, and if you don't have an Adobe license, too bad, you can't tell if it's real or not. So that's, that's the alternative that scares me. Oh, interesting, thank you. So we, we've um, we've hit our time. So uh, please, they, first of all, thank you guys. Um, anyone else who uh, needs to jump off to another call or um, meeting or just needs to go to the bathroom, <laughs> please do. But I have a question. So if, if you guys want to. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll continue. I'll, should I take yours first or there's a few in the chat? There's a few. Yeah, there's a few in the chat. So maybe take yeah. those and then I'll, I'll just. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take I'll take Phil's because it's the easiest one, I think. Um, uh, all we're doing is is hashing. Uh, even the crappiest cameras can do it. Like we've we've done this thing on a Pi Zero. Um, uh, connectivity can be an issue, um, so you need to have some sort of caching built in on the device to make sure that uh, whatever periodicity you've chosen for sending up the anchors, uh, that much you can keep on device uh, before it gets finally uh, sent over to the blockchain. But processing power, low image quality is a is a feature, not a bug, because then there's just less to process. Um, and yeah, thanks, Kirti and Sarkoshan, for those links. I'll have a chat with you guys afterwards. Uh, Eric, go. Yeah, so the um, I guess I'm trying to think that because because I've I've downloaded the app and I'm looking at it and I say, okay, I'm taking a picture and I'm posting it, and it's you know, and it's great. I've got this visual representation and details of the providence. Um, but it seems that once those images are off my phone and out of the app and circulating, I've kind of broken that chain because then you could just, again, what you're in the, the um, mode of, well, I can uh, uh, visually make it look like it's got this provenance trail, but I've sort of taken it out of its, its trust home. So how, do you, how does that 
uh, work for you guys? Yeah, right now we don't have a very convincing solution. Being completely honest, so what we do is if you're if you're in the app, you can see that you export it, and we basically overlay uh, a QR code that points you back to the trusted anchor uh, on the blockchain. But obviously, you could just fake an entire image. We are relying on the viewer to proactively click on the QR code or the link that's uh, watermarked on the image and go there. Mm -hmm. Uh, which which iPhones, to be fair, make it very easy. You just have to long press on a QR code and it will take you to the link and we'll just show you exactly what uh, the image claims to come from. Um, right. But yeah, it does rely on the viewer doing something on the other end. Right, looking for that evidence. And I think you and I had a sort of white labeling. So you've got you've got the, the the frankly app, but the technology itself might be interesting to 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 incorporate into existing apps where they say, hey, um, yep. you can tag this photo as you know being authentic and 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 um, um, having provenance as part yep. of you know Instagram or, or something else. I mean, yeah, that's where we would assume we make most of the revenue, right? Where you've got use cases where this sort of social media e user interface is not what you want. Maybe you want you're an insurance company and you want to make sure that you're only sending photos from the person claim, making a claim to the company and no one else. Uh, maybe you want better depth information because you want to also do better estimation of the damage caused to the car. Um, so there are these sort of specific features that we can white label into these B2B solutions. The um, for, for you and, and Matthew, I think you uh, the the theme for this year for this uh, ecosystem foundry working group is seeding the ecosystem because you've got a solution, you've got a technology, and you've got a market. But that market, you know, how do you seed that market? And so it was interesting to see how you guys sort of poked around and looked at different use cases, and and you know, looking at the app as part of the seeding and saying, well, if we can get you know get some some uh, some sort of traction out there that could be a um, a jumping off point for for another use case or yeah and, and part of the reason why we went down the sort of mass market approach is we want people to tell us their use cases right like we, we just want to observe how people use this technology um and if we see traction on one use case we'll just develop a specific feature for that um yeah there's there's only like a dozen of us, we can only come up with a dozen brains worth of ideas. <laughs>